Hi, I'm Rashonda Kate. This is Reading with Rashonda, and today we are starting to read Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. So a little bit about William and Ellen Craft. They um, were fugitive slaves, they were married, and they escaped to freedom in 1848. They wrote this book in 1860, and I am um, just have to say we need to keep in mind all of the lessons we learned in Clotel as we read this book and I'll point some things out as we're reading um, I don't know but I can only imagine that William Wells Brown in Clotel which he published in 1853 took some of the action from William and Ellen Craft's story so they escaped from slavery to freedom in 1848 and everybody knew it. Um, they were fugitive slaves, but people knew who they were. They were on the lecture circuit. It was one of the most stunning and talked about slavery escapes at the time. So it was public. People knew that this had happened. And around 1850, the couple moved to England because of the um, fugitive slave laws. There were several different fugitive slave laws. The most horrific one came out in 1850, which basically said, if you're white and you see a black person, you need to send them back to slavery. I'm paraphrasing, you know, there's legalities and whatnot in there, but it was very dangerous to be a black person. I had more to say, but I'll just stop. It's very, it was very dangerous to be a black person because there were people who were never slaves, but were sold into slavery due to the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. And people who were slaves were terrified for their lives that they would get sold back into slavery. So William and Ellen Craft, William and Ellen Craft running a thousand miles for freedom. Um, they escaped in 1848. This was written in 1860 and we'll get started. I'm reading it on um, my Kindle app on my phone and not a book. So I don't know, we'll do what we will for that. Preface. Having heard while in slavery that God made of one blood all nations of men, and also that the American Declaration of Independence says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we could not understand by what right we were held as chattels. Therefore, we felt perfectly justified in undertaking the dangerous and exciting task of running a thousand miles in order to obtain those rights which are so vividly set forth in the Declaration. I beg those who would know the particulars of our journey to peruse these pages. This book is not intended as a full history of the life of my wife nor myself, but merely as an account of our escape, together with other matter which I hope may be the means of creating in some minds a deeper abhorrence of the sinful and abominable practice of enslaving and brutifying our fellow creatures. Without stopping to write a long apology for offering this little volume to the public, I shall commence at once to pursue my simple story. W. Craft. Before we go on, this was written by William and Ellen Craft. The couple wrote this book. Sometimes most of the credit is given to William for writing the book because it was the 1860s and he is the man. I, so I just wanted to pause and say, this is a book by the couple. I've heard stories that it's more by Ellen. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know it's by both of them. So we get to hear both William and Ellen's voices in this. Part one. God gave us only over beast, fish, fowl, dominion absolute. That right we hold by his donation. But man over man, he made not Lord, such title to himself reserving human left from human free by Milton. My wife and myself were born in different towns in the state of Georgia, which is one of the principal slave states. It is true, our condition as slaves was not by any means the worst, but the mere idea that we were held as chattels and deprived of all legal rights 
the thought that we had to give up our hard earnings to a tyrant to enable him to live in idleness and luxury, the thought that we could not call the bones and sinews that God gave us our own, but above all, the fact that another man had the power to tear from our cradle the newborn babe and sell it in the shambles like a brute and then scourge us if we dared to lift a finger to save it from such a faint, haunted us for years. But in December 1848, a plan suggested itself that proved quite successful, and in eight days after it was first thought of, we were free from the horrible trammels of slavery, rejoicing and praising God in the glorious sunshine of liberty. My wife's first master was her father, and her mother his slave, and the latter is still the slave of his widow. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Ellen Craft's first master was her father. Not uncommon. Um, Ellen's mother was of mixed race. So in the terminology of the day, she would have been a mulatto. And Ellen having a white father and a mulatto mother would have been called a quadroon. All of that to say, um, she was three-fourths white and one-fourth black, which, like, what does that mean, actually? Um, back then, it meant she was a slave. <laughs> but it also meant she was really fair-skinned, <laughs> and she looked white. So here is this slave master, the owner of his white daughter, who is a slave. Like, that's just bananas and wild and happened all the time. And if we think about Clotel by William Wells Brown, it was a very similar thing. Um, Clotel and her sister Althesa were the daughters of Thomas Jefferson, and this is in the novel, not in real life. They were the daughters of Thomas Jefferson in the novel Clotel, and they had a mulatto mother. So they were quadroons whose father, whose father was also their master. We'll see several parallels between Clotel and running a thousand miles for freedom, and this is just the first. So I will continue reading. Notwithstanding my wife being of African extraction on her mother's side, she is almost white. In fact, she is so nearly so that the tyrannical old lady to whom she first belonged became so annoyed at finding her frequently mistaken for a child of the family that she gave her, when 11 years of age, to a daughter as a wedding present. Congratulations on your marriage! Have a slave! That's bananas to me. Happened all the time, too. This separated my wife from her mother and also from several other dear friends, but the incessant cruelty of her old mistress made the change of owners or treatment so desirable that she did not grumble much at this cruel separation. It may be remembered that slavery in America is not at all confined to persons of any particular complexion. There are a very large number of slaves as white as anyone, but as the evidence of a slave is not admitted in court against a free white person, it is almost impossible for a white child, after having been kidnapped and sold into or reduced to slavery in a part of the country where it is not known, as often is the case, ever to recover its freedom. So in Clotel, William Wells Brown tells the story of, um, I think she might have been German, of a little girl who was white but was kidnapped and sold into slavery. And we get this same sort of telling here in um, William and Ellen Craft's book. Their book was published after Clotel was published, but their story was public before Clotel was published. So I'm just saying that some of the similarities are, you know, probably intentional. And maybe the crafts, you know, got some things from William Wells Brown, but there are some points in the story that I'm like, oh, it's the same thing. All right, I'll keep reading. 
I have myself conversed with several slaves who told me that their parents were white and free, but that they were stolen away from them and sold when quite young, as they could not tell their address, and also as the parents did not know what had become of their lost and dear little ones, of course all traces of each other were gone. The following facts are sufficient to prove that he who has the power and is inhuman enough to trample upon the sacred rights of the weak cares nothing for race or color. In March 1818, three ships arrived at New Orleans. Mm, we've talked about New Orleans before and the quadroon balls and the severity of the slave market. Mm, New Orleans. In March 1818, three ships arrived at New Orleans, bringing several hundred German immigrants from the province of Alsace on the Lower Rhine. Among them were Daniel Muller and his two daughters, Dorothea and Salome, whose mother had died on the passage. Okay, so this is the same story that William Wells Brown told in Clotel. Um, I'm pretty sure he talked about Salome in there. Soon after his arrival, Muller, taking with him his two daughters, both young children, went up to the river at Atacapis Parish to work on the plantation of John F. Miller. A few weeks later, his relatives, who had remained at New Orleans, learned that he had died of the fever of the country. They immediately sent for the two girls, but they had disappeared. And the relatives, notwithstanding, repeated and persevering in, yeah, repeated and persevering inquiries and researches, could find no traces of them. They were at length given up for dead. Dorothea was never heard was never again heard of, nor was anything known of Salome from 1818 till 1843. In the summer of that year, Madame Carl, a German woman who had come over in the same ship with the Mullers, was passing through a street in New Orleans and accidentally saw Salome in a wine shop belonging to Louis Belmont, by whom she was held as a slave. Madame Carl recognized her at once and carried her to the house of another German woman, Mrs. Schubert, who was Salome's cousin and godmother, and who no sooner set eyes on her than, without having any intimation that the discovery had been previously made, she unhesitatingly exclaimed, My God, here is the long-lost Salome Muller. The law reporter, in its account of this case, says, As many of the German immigrants of 1818 as could be gathered together were brought to the house of Mrs. Schubert, and every one of the number who had any recollection of the little girl upon the passage or any acquaintance with her father and mother immediately identified the woman before them as the long-lost Salome Muller. By all these witnesses who appeared at the trial, the identity was fully established. The family resemblance in every feature was declared to be so remarkable that some of the witnesses did not hesitate to say that they should know her among 10,000, that they were as certain the plaintiff was Salome Muller, the daughter of Daniel and Dorothea Muller, as of their own existence. Among the witnesses who appeared in court was the midwife who had assisted at the birth of Salome. She testified to the existence of certain peculiar marks upon the body of the child, which were found exactly as described by the surgeons who were appointed by the court to make an examination for the purpose. And here surgeons just means doctor. There was no trace of African descent in any feature of Salome Muller. Oh, let's stop there. No trace of African descent in any feature of Salome Muller. She didn't look like a black person yet and and not not in any way not her hair not her nose not any of the things that people say make black people look like black people none of those things existed in her yet an entire society was happy to accept her as a slave why is that we could say a lot of things greed inhumanity but a large part of it was they were used to white people being slaves there were all kinds of people who were legal slaves, um, whose mothers were black, so they were black. They looked white as anybody, didn't have any of the features associated with being a black person. They didn't think twice about seeing a white person who was a slave because they saw it all the time. That says something. I'm not sure what it says, but it says something about how we think about where one race begins and where another race ends what are the characteristics of those races and what are the rights of those races if i look just as white as you how come i don't have the same rights as you if the rights that you were given are based solely on how you look 
right? There are all kinds of questions and conundrums wrapped up in this. And while I'm not reading, this book is written in two parts. It doesn't have a bunch of distinct chapters. So I'm going to read until I get to a good stopping point. We're, but we're about 15 minutes in, so I'll stop us soon. All right, back to the book. There was no trace of African descent in any feature of Salome Muller. She had long, straight black hair, hazel eyes, thin lips, and a Roman nose. The complexion of her face and neck was as dark as that of the darkest brunette. It appears, however, that during the 25 years of her servitude, she had been exposed to the sun's rays in the hot climate of Louisiana with head and neck unsheltered, as is customary with the female slaves, while laboring in the cotton or the sugar field. Those parts of her person which had been shielded from the sun were comparatively white. So let's, I know I keep stopping. Uh, I know I'm a horrible person. But um, if we remember from Clotel, Clotel's daughter whose name i can't recall just at the moment um her mistress made her go outside and work in the fields without her head or neck covered to intentionally make her suntan so she actually looked like she was black because she just looked like a little white girl um her mom was clotel who was three-fourths white and her dad was a white man so she was a white person but she was enslaved and just here, just like Salome Muller, she wasn't allowed to cover up from the sun so she could look like she was black because nothing else read like she was black. All right. Belmont, the pretended owner of the girl, had obtained possession of her by an act of sale from John F. Miller, the planter in whose service Salome's father died. This miller was a man of consideration and substance, owning large sugar estates and bearing a high reputation for honor and honesty and for indulgent treatment of his slaves. It was testified on the trial that he had said to Belmont a few weeks after the sale of Salome that she was white and had as much right to her freedom as anyone and was only to be retained in slavery by care and kind treatment. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. That she was white and had as much right to her freedom as anyone and was only to be retained in slavery by care and kind treatment. Look, I know she's white. I know she should be free. But if you promise to be good to her, I'ma sell her as a slave to you. That'll be fine, won't it? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I want to stop here for a minute, but I'm going to keep going. The broker who negotiated the sale from Miller to Belmont in 1838 testified in court that he then thought and still thought that the girl was white. The case was elaborately argued on both sides, but was at length decided in favor of the girl by the Supreme Court declaring that she was free and white and therefore unlawfully held in bondage. I'm just looking to see if there's a good place to stop. That's probably our best place. All right, so we haven't even really gotten into William and Ellen Craft's story, except for we know Ellen Craft looks like a white woman and immediately behind that we get a story about a white woman who was falsely enslaved that is not accidental what we're supposed to do as readers is to instead of really picturing Salome Muller who was born white and free picture Ellen who was born white and enslaved and we're supposed to wonder what the difference is between them they both found themselves enslaved, but Salome was um, declared free and white. Why can't we do the same for Ellen? So that's the point of putting these stories side by side to show that there's no difference between them, none. Why should one get to be free and the other doesn't? So that's what we'll stop for today. I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda.